Working Cows Podcast, episode 306. This episode is brought to you by Ranching.FYI. This episode is also brought to you by Sunshine Bible Academy. Welcome to the podcast that gives producers a platform to discuss and share paradigm-challenging practices. Practices that have increased the effectiveness of their operation and the joy that their families have received from this lifestyle. Hi everybody, this is Clay Connery, host of the Working Cows podcast, recorded exclusively in the C90 Ocean Mineral Studios. And this episode is brought to you by Ranching.FYI. You've been told the importance of running a business, but do you still feel like your business isn't fully mature yet? Sure, you're profitable, you have a mission, but you can't get to that next level where things run smoothly and effectively. Wouldn't it be nice to have good people and good processes that can improve your operating rather than hinder it? Running a business doesn't have to be painful. You can take control. Let's work together to make that happen. Meet Right is a brand new online course offered by Ranching.FYI and RanchRight LLC. In the course, you will learn the right way to lead meetings on your ranch that actually move the needle and set your operation up for success. If you're ready to maximize your meetings, then join Meet Right today and start doing meetings right. Classes kick off June 22nd with limited seats available, so sign up today at ranching.fyi slash register. That's ranching.fyi slash register. Very excited to share with you today a conversation that I had live in Jeff Pribino's office. Jeff is uh, the father of Logan Pribino. Logan's been a guest a couple of different times here on the Working Cows podcast and was recently a guest also on the Ranching Reboot podcast and uh, really looking forward to sharing with you this conversation where we talk a little bit about the history of the Wine Glass Ranch, how it came to be put together, and really more importantly, how they have gone about transitioning it from generation to generation and through different management styles and come into a management style that that fits their environment. So really looking forward to sharing this conversation with you. I hope you enjoy my conversation with Logan Pribino, but mostly Jeff Pribino. Logan was there and uh, peppered throughout a little bit, but mostly Jeff and I are just talking about the history of his family's ranch. So here's my conversation. They're live in the office at Wine Glass Ranch. Get started here. Jeff, Logan, thanks for joining me today on the Working Cows Podcast. Thanks for making the trip out to yeah. here in Nebraska. Thank you. Thanks for your hospitality and appreciate the opportunity to come out and put some boots on the ground here and see what's going on. I've heard a lot about it over the years uh, and so really excited to kind of get to see it firsthand. Sure. Maybe you need to come... One year when the 12 month rolling rainfall isn't nine inches, though. <laughs> <laughs> you feel like you're living in uh, northern Mexico? <laughs> yeah. That's kind of what I'd like to hear a little bit about is uh, kind of uh, just a brief history, maybe, from your okay. perspective All of right. the ranch. And uh, yeah, we'll go from there. Well, the ranch was homesteaded in 1888 by my great grandfather. He came out from uh, Russell, Iowa. He had served in the Civil War and, and could receive a quarter of land. And so he took the train to the town called Elsie and then walked the last 20 miles, and proved up on the claim, uh, which is north of Imperial, about 12 miles. He had some pretty tough years to get started, but he had some backing back in Iowa. He went back for a year or part of the year a couple times. But then he brought his wife, and and they they raised five children on the ranch. Uh, his name was Sherman McCoy, and he was a corn farmer. So he imagined coming out and breaking up all this sod and uh, with horses and plows, and uh, he was able to put together a really good size operation uh, for the day. 
ended up with quite a bit of land. A lot of it was, was farm, but a lot of it was pasture for the workhorses. And at some point, he started a, a cow herd uh, not long after that. So it was primarily farming with then cattle. And then as he acquired more land, it became more cattle than the farm ground. And uh, all five of his children uh, went off to college and, and went away. So he was left with his wife, Susie, to, to manage things. He passed away in 1938. My grandmother and her husband, uh, Bud Stenger, moved here and took over the reins after he passed away. And so my grandfather was managing a operation with with four other uh, siblings uh, with ownership, and some of those some of those uh, folks still have some ownership of the ranch. Mm-hmm. We've got two parts of that of the family that that still own a portion. Um, so he kept it together by managing. You know, uh, the ground he put together and what he uh, and his wife, Mary, owned. And and then he uh, had managed what was called the McCoy estate. And, uh, and then my uh, dad be- came onto the picture in 1964 or 3, something like that. And he had a farm in south part of uh, the county, and they put the operations together. So it was all farm ground south of Imperial, and eighty-five percent ranch north of Imperial. Hmm. And they formed a business called Stinger Pribino Limited. So that's my grandfather's name, my dad's name, which uh, was my grandparents and my parents and me and my three sisters were part of that business. We operated that for many years. Uh, when I came back from college, my dad said I, he was kind of tired of farming and ranching, so we got into the banking business. Mm. So I was in business with my grandfather. Uh, so it was, he and I were managing the whole operation and uh, for 10 years before he passed away. So mm. I had 10 years of guidance. Uh, and then when he passed away, I, I took over and, and managed my family, uh, my sisters and me and, uh, and my parents, and, and then eventually bought them all out. And in 92, formed a company called Wineglass Ranch, which is the operating company. So Wineglass Ranch does all the work. Um, all the land is owned in what's called Lone Star Ranch, and that's what the that's what my grandfather had put put together. Uh, and when they started the Lone Star Ranch back in actually it was before my grandfather came, uh, they had a Star brand, and it was called Lone Star Ranch. But a Star brand just doesn't make a good brand. Yeah. It's kind of a blob. Yeah, we call that the Scar Bar Blotch, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So uh, he found a wine glass brand, uh, and in 1938 he registered that, and so we were Lone Star Ranch with a wine glass brand, and I kind of brought it all together to 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 become Wine Glass Ranch, and that's what we're known as today. And so I've operated uh, the ranch since uh, the late 70s, and then Logan. My oldest son uh, moved here in 2012 and has worked his way into uh, owner and the general manager of the business. And I'm semi-retired. Good. So that's the history. I appreciate that. A um, couple of things going back to to that story. In my neighborhood, a lot of those places got put together as people were unable to prove up on the homestead, they would just keep adding the adjoining quarters. Is that similar to yeah, how it worked that's here? that's right. He, uh, he'd trade a horse or two for 
for the land or, you know, something. Sometimes it was money, but, you know, they would take almost anything back then in the early, early days. So it sure. was pretty tough out here. <laughs> And is that, so in my neighborhood, I think a lot of that was because of what the USDA was, or whatever it was at that time, FSA, whatever they were asking them to do was kind of unfeasible in That's my right. neighborhood. Yeah. Trying to farm this country was kind of Yeah, tough. 160 acres, you couldn't do anything. Right. So then they, I believe it's the Kincaid Act, they let you uh, get 640 acres, mm-hmm. which still isn't enough here, right. but at least it was a better start. And, and and some land was added that way later. And then they had programs like with the tree claim. If you put trees on some ground, you could claim it. And there were a number of right. incentives <laughs> back in the day, to my, to my understanding. Right. In so, my neighborhood, they had a desert claim. If oh, you really? put in a dam, if you would build a stock dam, okay. you, could have a, you could have a half section. Oh, wow. It was called the desert claim, which oh, wow. kind of is fitting, like you said, over the last few years. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> So, yeah. What have been, I guess, some of the keys to keeping the place together over the years? What do you think? Well, I've, it's, it's a family operation, first of all. So there's been a number of family members involved, uh, mostly as owners. We've only had typically one or two families operating. Uh, there was a point in my management where I had 20 landowners I was taking care of. Uh, so that's the maximum that we ever had. All family members, but they all had some piece of the ranch, and mm-hmm. so I was taking care of, of all their land. So the challenge is keeping everybody satisfied and, and happy. And um, I, I come from a history of that, so I didn't have to... I was kind of taught how to how to do that. Most of it involves acknowledging the history and the heritage of the ranch and mm-hmm. letting people be a part of that. Mm-hmm. And because the ownership is nothing unless you can say, "Hey, I, that's my family. I came from there," you know, or my great grandparents came from there. Right. So. So you're is it kind of what you're saying is is telling a bigger story of the ranch as far as its history and and inviting people into that is that kind of what you're yeah it's not again it's the ownership is worth more than than the dollars yeah um we try to provide uh, the acknowledgement that it, it's more than that it's yeah. it's not a wall street investment it's something you can Right. You, you can drive over here anytime you want to from wherever they are and and belong. Yeah. And that matters. That yep. matters to to my family it has. Uh, now, you know, we've really trimmed that down and we've purchased most of those uh folks out. So today we just have Logan and Brianna and Connie and Jeff and uh three or four other family members that have ownership at this point. So it's it's uh, simplified it in some ways. Uh, it's added uh, a lot more debt than you'd... Because you, know, sure. you have to trade that for... Yeah. You know, instead of having family members, we've got bankers. So yeah. <laughs> that's, the, that's the trade-off. Managing relationships no matter what you do. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And how early was the, the land and the... Operating separated. How long? In it was in ninety two. Okay, when we separated. Sure. And so would that have been the influence of ranching for profit? Yes, it was. Stan Parsons. Yeah, I was involved in his group from the beginning, and uh, I had learned so much from him. Uh, he was so good about not telling you. If you asked him a question, he would never answer it. Uh, <laughs> This is the best instructor I ever had. And he was just one of those magic people. But he had a worldly view. and uh, But that that's the time when a lot of businesses got the idea that that's what they needed to do. And it's a brilliant idea. 
through the ranching for profit school. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Right. What is that? How has that helped, or what what difference has that made for you guys? Well, what uh, what it allowed us, my wife and I, to do is to to actually start our own business, and then just lease the property from the from the family, and that gave us the uh, autom- autonomy and and the ability to to make decisions just on our families. Sure. Because we had kids then, and and we'd gotten to the point where we'd been involved a long time, and you know the the, the rest of my sisters or family member didn't really need to know what we were spending every dollar on on a day to day basis. Right. Yeah. So that gave us a lot of freedom to to uh, do some different things, and with that, I with that freedom, I I, I had. I build a feed yard with three partners, mm. Imperial Beef, and uh, uh, on the ranch, uh, right in the middle of the ranch. It's right on the pretty close to the highway, but mm-hmm. we were able to uh, put together quite an operation there. We we owned and ran that for ten years, and then uh, a guy walked in the office and said, "I want to buy your feed yard." And I, I said it's not for sale. Well, he kept coming back and coming back, and I guess it turned out it was for sale. So. <laughs> but it was a very good ve- uh, venture uh, for the community and the and our ranch because of the manure and purchase hmm. purchasing of all the grain that's that's raised in our area because we're primarily an irrigated crop area. We have two things: we have irrigated crop, very little dry land crops, and then Sand Hills ranch land. Our operation is 85% Sand Hills ranch land and the rest is dry land farm ground. We don't have any irrigation at this point. We have had from time to time, but we don't. So our operation is managing grassland, native grassland, and dry land cropland. So that's what we do every day. We've got a big chunk of ground to to take care of every every year, and it's a big responsibility, and we don't take it lightly. Hmm. Tell me about the '80s. What was your experience? Well, fortunately, I came back at the right time because uh, my grandfather was very conservative. His family grew up. Well, he grew up in Columbus, Nebraska, and and his dad was a big farmer, but he he didn't make it through the 30s. Mm-hmm. So my grandfather was very nervous about dad, and sure. and so I came back to an operation with very little debt, and but not very progressive either. I mean, people were putting in irrigation wells at the time, and he wasn't. When I came back, I I didn't push for that. I I just needed. I just wanted to give him the ability to live the rest of his life without me turning it completely upside down. So we, there were some tough years there, but uh, without a lot of debt and paying 17% interest, we were okay. <laughs> you say you were coming back from where? I went to Lincoln to college and had a, got a degree in ag economics and, uh, I uh, was in the master's program for a year. Uh, I could have easily finished that up, but it was my wife graduated at the same time with an elementary education degree, and she had a job, and we were coming back, so I just left. So I have a, a more of a business background, but uh, I, you know, I was in ag college most of the time, studied animal science and agronomy, a lot of that. So we've got a really well-rounded uh, education for for what I you know what I ended up doing. Right. Yeah. And the the business background was after college as well, or did you come right back to the ranch? After I came college? right back to the ranch. I worked in uh, worked in Lincoln for a year, actually, while I was uh, in that program in that master's program. 
I see. But that's the only other job I've had, other than working during college. I did mm-hmm. some right. jobs, you know, during college. Gotcha. So I've been, you know, and I was needed to really to come back. I mean, I wasn't planning to come back, but after I got halfway through college, I thought, you know, they need me. I want to go there. I know what to do because I'd worked my whole life. Right. You know, I was either horseback or on a tractor mm-hmm. since I was a kid. So it was pretty easy for sure. me to, to come back in. So. And and was that from the, uh, you were needed here from a labor perspective? or And management. Mm-hmm. I mean, my grandfather was uh, 75 okay. when I came back. So, and my dad was, he he had a lot of other interests. And like I said, he bought a bank and <laughs> went into banking. So, so I was left with him, which was a, really a nice, nice thing. So, yeah. Can you tell me a little bit about your experience working with your grandpa and some of the yeah. well, lessons? I, the most important thing is, is almost every day I ate lunch mm. at my grandmother's table. And I, my other grandmother on my dad's side at our other farm was alive too, and I would actually eat lunch when I was working down there. But the ranch was most of the time. And so, you know, we had table top conversations, you know, almost every day, you know. So, and he was a big thinker. Hmm. He was a big reader, and uh, he was... Uh, both he and my grandmother went to the University of Nebraska in the teens. Mm. So, <laughs> so, but they were, uh, I got a lot of, I got a lot of information. If you can imagine having oh, yeah. that opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's what I've, over the last few years, I've been on a journey to try and capture some of those conversations with the guys in my neighborhood that are in their 90s, you know, mm-hmm. and, you know, some of those guys remember that country before there were fences. Mm-hmm. You know, it was all open range, you know. And so, and I was spurred on to that by one of the guys that was a member of the church who had been a member of the church since he was a young young guy. And I went and sat down with him one day and he just spouted off for two hours about sheep and cattle and ranching and growing up out there. And that was the last lucid conversation I had with him. Because after that, he you'd show up and he'd start telling you about a dream he had. And by the time he uh-huh. got to the end of telling you about it, it was the reality that he was still waiting for them to come pick him up and take him out riding horses, you know. And so sure. I was like, man, you got to start capturing this stuff now. And sure. so that's uh, some invaluable uh, yeah. perspective and knowledge. Yeah. you have anything that stands out from those conversations? or? Oh, um no, there was so much of it, <laughs> you know. Uh, if you know, if I only would have had a handful of those meals, you know, sure. then you yeah. would some of that would stick. But you know, I had so many of them. It just so, becomes part of you. And, yeah. yeah, and my folks lived in town too, so I had I had people to bounce. You know, my dad, I you know, I bounced ideas off of him, and and so I had some. Had somebody to ask, hey, what do you think about this? Or why are things like this? Mm. So, Was uh, your grandpa around for the transition to the separation of the land from... He was not. Okay. Yeah. He passed away in 86, and then we, we did the transition in 92. So Yeah. That separation always seems really key to me, and I think you've said it is, but for... From my perspective, one of the reasons it's key is because you're always making the most or it's a a greater influence to make the most profitable decision. Like, is it best for us to write a check for these cows to graze this grass to this company? Or is it better for somebody else's cows to write that check? Right. And I'm a accountant by heart. I mean, I kept (laughs) I kept I knew those numbers even before that. This was more of a family dynamic. Right thing than knowing the numbers because if I was ever uh, at fault I was I run I ran too many numbers instead of just getting out there and working sure and uh, 
what you tend to do when you're younger till you get a feel for what how things work and what things cost and mm. so but yeah it was more about that and it was not easy to do uh my family was not ha- real happy about that idea them not being involved in the day-to-day part of the business knowing what was going on there and uh i had to have some advisors and and some mentors get involved to help us through that process Mm -hmm. and it went smooth but it was hard to get it smooth Mm -hmm. didn't just happen yeah and i doubt if they ever do so when you ever you make changes business changes in a family Mm -hmm. there are lots of questions and and concerns so anyway we got that accomplished and and now we're transitioning to Logan and Brianna. It's a lot easier because it's just one other family. I do have another son, but um, he's not really interested in the ranch, and and so we're taking care of him in other ways. Mm-hmm. Let's take a quick break and hear from our sponsor today, Sunshine Bible Academy. My name is Kayla Hinman. I graduated from Sunshine in 2002. Um also married um, one of my classmates, Craig. We have five kids who I have homeschooled from the start. We chose to send Abby, my oldest, mostly due to our experience at Sunshine together. The staff, the community that we, and the friends that we developed, we felt like it would be a a good transition for Abby as she left our house and went out into the world um, in a safe place to maybe to make mistakes with people who would help correct them in a way that maybe a parent can't. We've also developed friendships with staff while we were here that has transitioned into deeper fellowship as we've gotten older and they've helped raise our kids um, while they're here. Um, We do plan to send the other ones also, Lord willing, and um, really fun for us to come. Um, Sporting events or um, auctions or anything that we can get together and have deeper fellowship with other families that have also made the sacrifice to send their child here as well. Talk to me a little bit through that family transition and, and um, how you, how I don't know, pitched is the right word, or sold the rest of the family on the idea of making that switch. What were some of the keys for you guys to do that successfully? Well, I was able to, to say I had been attending classes in Colorado ranching for profit classes uh, where I had learned this is what's this is the way to go and this is what people are doing now um, even our attorney was not on board yet with that kind of a structure later I, I we changed attorneys and did it a different way but uh, that was a kind of new thinking even for you know, estate planning attorneys. Uh, they hadn't really thought that through. Mm. To my knowledge, you know, the people that I were involved, I was involved with, and all the other ranches I knew. I knew, you know, many ranches and families. Right. I was pretty well connected in Nebraska, and I was involved in the Nebraska Cattlemen. I served as president for mm. a year, and so I got to really know a number of ranchers and their families, what kind of struggles they were dealing with to a certain degree. You, mm-hmm. know, you don't get to know everything and don't want to know everything. <laughs> but what it, one thing I did uh, learn in the 80s, you asked about the 80s, is mm-hmm. the family ranches started to disappear in the 80s. A number of those old family ranches that I knew as a younger person were purchased by Ted Turner and Mormon Ranch and... Mm-hmm feed yard owners from Texas, and I just go down, surgeons from Omaha, I could just go down the line. And that's that's continuing to happen. I think family ranches are in peril going forward. Mm-hmm. I yeah. think we're going to have to deal with uh, people that made billions of dollars coming in and, and buying properties. Right. Uh- and I'm not happy about that. A safe place to park cash slash yes. a place to hunt birds and <laughs> yeah. yes, you know, I mean, whatever the motivation is, but yeah, and I think that was kind of um, 
probably the first time I heard your name mentioned might have even been before I heard Logan's name mentioned and uh, it was in connection with your passion for the next generation I think and and doing things to figure out how to bring the next generation along so I'd, I mean since we're there I've got other notes here but uh, since we're there I'd, I'd like to hear some more of your perspective on that well uh, I have seen so many family businesses fail not just ranches mm that the parents thought they needed to split up the property equally and then leave one person on the operation with their share. For example, I've, we've got a number of local businesses where you have four, five, six siblings. They each own like a sixth, and, the, and your farmer that's left back to farm gets to own a sixth of it. Mm-hmm. And never, never works. Kind of back to that 160 acres thing. It's not yeah. enough. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's really not fair. And, and that's what we learned in Ranching for Profit. And, and the university really got on board. University of Nebraska really got on board. Uh, not long after that, really digging into some of these issues like we're talking about now and say, hey, this is, they can't make recommendations, but that, you know, we these are got, things you need to watch out for. Yeah, and I get and we we you know we attended a number of those. Uh, had some good some good good people to to help. But uh, in my case, I had four. There were four of us. I had three sisters, and we ended up splitting up the business. I owned twice as much as they did, so I ended up with forty percent, mm-hmm. and they each had twenty. Uh, which barely worked. Still left you as a major- minority shareholder. It still <laughs> left me as a major- ma- minority shareholder, exactly. So that barely worked. It wouldn't work for very many people. Not that I'm special, but it just wouldn't. Uh, I think we're to the point today with with uh, real estate, the valuation of real estate is way overpriced. Uh, I used to think it would take twice as much income as you really can get to, to actually pay for the land. Mm-hmm. That Back in my day, that kind of worked. Now it's probably four, it takes about four times the income. That's just my gut feeling. To, to See if you wanted to buy some buy right. property and, and actually pay it off in some time. So I think my thinking has changed to where... The person that's on the operation running it, if they prove to be adequate and good managers, which you never know, you've got to go through a vetting process there. Uh, I think you need to own most of that property right. for them to, to, if you want to, the business to, to continue to stay in the same family. Right. Yeah. And I don't know what that number is, but it's at least maybe 75% of it needs to go to that person. Now, if you have a deadbeat that stays back in farms, that's a problem. Right. So it's not just black and white. So if you have a good, uh, a, a good candidate, then uh, I think that's, that's what you need. Right. And I've been fortunate. Logan, uh, you know, he, he was... I told both boys they had to be gone for 10 years before they could even think about coming back. And Logan went off to California to college and was an accountant in California and traveled for a year and then came back. And so he's got a good business background. But he grew up on the ranch too. Right. He was on horses and tractors and built more fence than anybody I know. <laughs> and what was that what was was that uh some permanent some temporary all of the above that's when uh, they were developing the ranch in the 90s with the high tensile okay so we put it hundreds of miles mm-hmm. of high tensile fence yeah coming out of uh ranching for profit right we, we subdivided the ranch and and added a lot of water points uh which really helped the uh ecology of the property adds a lot of management but the ecology is like yeah noticeably better mm-hmm. we really 
because we were able to manage, manage, you know, and we do, we manage, you know, we've got cattle and we've got grass and we're managing it every day. Right. And is this kind of the edge of the sand hills? Are we? Yeah, there's some sand hills south of us. Um, then it kind of runs into sage. Sage. Mm-hmm. You get into eastern yep. Colorado and and New Mexico, and then it's it's sandy, but it's not it's not the sand hills grasses. We're mm-hmm. a mixed grass prairie, like the sand hills. Uh, sand hills are more of a a tall grass. Depending on where you are, the western sand hills are shorter grass. So we've got some short grass and some tall grass, but we have mixed grass, so it's very resilient. Uh, it doesn't have as much uh, protein to it uh, as the short grass, but uh, it's it is. You know, we've got short grass, medium-sized grasses, and tall grasses, and cool season and warm season. So we've got a great mix. And we strive for that diversity. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, the worst thing you can have is just one yeah. monoculture. <laughs> so we strive to, to you know, bring in as many species as we can, not only plants but animals too. Mm-hmm. And we've been able to add lots of birds and wildlife uh, with the practices that we've done. Yeah, you've kind of been able to see that transition. What was the state, or what was the, uh, what, how was the prairie managed when before you started to implement some of these things? Well, a tip, the typical rancher just had large pastures and mm-hmm. one windmill tank, and you know you put cows in there and calves, check the water every other day or so, and mm-hmm. and so the cattle. There's a lot of worried, worried areas around the, the water source. And plus, the cattle keep continuing to eat the same grass that they like right. and kill it out. Mm-hmm. And uh, sand blue stem is a real key grass for us. And you know, in a couple of years, we were, we were able to bring that sand blue stem back because hmm. uh, they'd completely right. taken it out. But the seeds are there. And mm. and we've got a nice mix of sand reed and sand blue stem. Yeah, I always think that one of the more powerful phrases in ranching is overgrazing and undergrazing in the same pasture. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's right. That's a good case. Everybody should hear that phrase at least once, you know, and then go ride through a field if they've got uh, if they've got a big pasture. Go mm-hmm. ride through it and just notice what's happening around the water point. And sure. what's happening far away from it? You know, sure. you've got probably in my neighborhood, we've got uh, smooth brome killing everything else out mm-hmm. in the places far from the water tank, and you've got uh, buffalo grass is about all you've got left near the water tank because it's the only thing that can survive in that right. management regime. So I think that the, those are some of the some of the things that happen. So that's been a interesting. An interesting transition to watch, I'm sure. Yeah. Well, other than the, the the management of the property, which we is number one for us, we've kept our cattle business very simple. I never really got into the AI and the big weaning weights. I saw a lot of farmers and ranchers go broke chasing weaning weaning rates because they had cows that they couldn't afford to keep. Right. Fortunately, we never went that far. We kept our rotate our, our breeding very simple, primarily Hereford Angus crosses. And uh, out of the, we had gotten more complicated. We never really changed the breeding, but uh, after ranching for profit, we really simplified the business. And I strove for one thousand cows per man. Hmm. So we kept it really simple, and we raised the kind of cows that could, didn't require hay and didn't require somebody to watch them to calve. <laughs> we calved in the hills, always have. Mm-hmm. Now, every once in a while, you'll have a cow that has a problem, but uh, we've always, the cows have to do all the work by themselves. And so I really pushed that to the limit, and in addition to that, uh, we ran a lot of yearlings in large groups. 
I had as many as 2,500 yearlings in a 300-acre pasture mm -hmm. and did that for a number of years. Uh, when we had the feed yard, too, we'd, we'd buy cattle and, and, and our cattle, too, and we'd run them in large groups and then walk them over the feed yard and finish them. And that was a good program, really good program. But there again, that's a lot, there's a lot of management there. Uh, mm. You have 2,500 steers. You've got some issues you have to deal with right. on a daily basis. Not not all day, but you know, you'll have some bowlers you got to deal with. That's about it. Right. Yeah, I think Doug Ferguson said it well um, when he said that if you want to want to create a critter that cannot survive in a range environment, breed them for carcass merits. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, there was a big push for that. Yeah, and, and I, I would have guessed that when you were in at the university, it would have been pretty strong. Actually, it was after that. Okay. Uh, when it was it was later than that, and it was a big push because we could we could get that information. Mm -hmm. um, I found myself chasing things because of the computer that I didn't need to chase because you could get information. Yeah. I mean, we could tag calves. We could, you know, I had all kinds of graphs up on the wall because I could graph. And uh, like I said, I just I went too far down that road. And I just then I just backed up and say, hey. These cows have got to work for us uh, because we can't afford them otherwise. Our ranch is, um, we don't have any other income. All of our family's income comes off the land. Mm. Most ranches have oil or they have owners that had mm -hmm. really good jobs. Uh, it's very rare to find ranches. You can get up in the sand hills, and there's still some families like ours that mm -hmm. have to actually live off the land. But those those are going by the wayside, which makes it hard because we have to compete with those folks, and they don't have to make money. Right. Well, that's the, that's the hardest thing about the cow-calf business is that you've got, especially south and east of here, but really in everywhere you've got people who are willing to do it at a loss that's right <laughs> that's right and i don't blame them no it's i great. love i love cows <laughs> i mean who doesn't i right. mean I, I mean there's no more pleasure in the world to be around cows and cows and calves yeah and range oh my goodness i mean people would pay a lot for that ability to go out and and be among that it's magic <laughs> Yeah. So do you think that Wine Glass Ranch, Lone Star Ranch, all of the iterations, do you think it's still here today without these changes, without the separation of the management from ownership or, you know, and without, you know, changes in the way you graze and focusing, simplifying the business? Well, that's hard to say. Right. You know, if, if I would have been somebody else and done something different. You know, you, you figure out how to make things work. Right. That's the path I chose. Um, it seemed to work for us. So uh, I, I'll say yes to your question, but, you know, I, all businesses are different and have different dynamics, and, and people make them work. You just make things work. Right. Yeah, the nicest way I can say it is success in life it generally is has a lot to do with uh, refusing to quit. That's the really yeah. nice way that I can say it. <laughs> There's yeah. a lot of, you it's know, true. and I think that if you refuse to quit, you can do something at a low return for a long time. You yes, know? <laughs> that's true. So we talked a little bit about the feed yard. Were there any, uh, really valuable lessons from the feed yard that, yeah, there were one of the biggest surprises for me is the health of the cattle and that in our feed yard. It was twenty well, thirty two thousand head feed yard. There were a lot of animals and the health was ten times better than our health of our animals on the range. And we we weren't given antibiotics and all that stuff. It's it's amazing that um and, and we it was a well managed yard with plenty of space and and we're in a dry climate, so it's you know, and they never were stand you know, it, in bad mud situations, but um, 
the care of the cattle in, in at least our feed yard was surprisingly great. And my impression of feed yards before that was, well, they're dirty and they smell and there's flies and and that was not the case at all. And that was a that was that was a big big lesson. Uh, there again, I had three partners, and and that couldn't have gone better. Very rarely can you put four guys together, invest in a business, and then end up at the end friends and <laughs> happy and and uh, we were able to to get that accomplished. And I was just blessed with. Some really good people, and not all different ages. Mm. I mean, we had a, a you know a sixty year old and a forty year old and a two forty year olds and a fifty year old. So it was a nice range of mm. ages, and and uh, I learned a lot about. Uh, I was actually the uh, chief financial officer for mm-hmm. that business. I raised all the money, and and. Uh, was in the office for five years, not every day. I was at the ranch half the time, but that was my job. And then was able to step away from that. But Was it um, mostly custom feeding? or We were 80% custom. And that's back in the day when there was more custom feeding. Uh, that business has become even more competitive, so it's harder to get custom uh, custom cattle now because um, if you own the feed yard you can buy cattle and feed the cattle and lose money on the cattle and still make money on the feed yard yeah i was sitting with a guy uh in the a very good sized dairy i'll just say that much sitting with him one night and i recognized him from somewhere else i flagged him down to eat supper with us and running lots of cows milking lots of cows and uh the check come around and I reached for it and he grabbed it and said, no, I'll pay. I made money on the grain futures this year. It's like, you're milking all these cows and you're making money on the grain futures. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Well, so, you just do what you have to do. And right. Some, you know, sometimes it's just luck. Yeah. But you have to be in, you have to be, you have to be playing. Yeah. Like yeah. you said, as soon as you quit, you're done. Yeah. So. You um, can't catch fish without your line in the water. That's right. That's that's a good analogy. Yeah. So was the the health of the cattle in the feed yard related to your environment, or was there some stockmanship that went along with that? There was some stockmanship, but what I referred to earlier was just in general. The feed yards are... Oh, I see. Are, you know, the animals are healthy, Mm -hmm. and they're happy. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'd take groups out and say we'd go sit on a hill and i said look at these cattle are they do they look happy yeah they look happy right so we spent uh you know we we worked with temple grandin Mm. on building that feed yard and uh Mm. um she helped us design some of the facilities and and i'd learned about her from uh stan parsons Mm. So from the ground up? Yeah, from the ground up. Wow. So, uh, and then Bud Williams, you know, we got involved in that right away. Mm -hmm. And the ranch was involved, and and the feed yard help was too. Hmm. And so there was a lot of training going on there. But we had good, we had good cowboys. They were Hispanic, but they were good. A lot of them are still at the feed yard. Mm -hmm. Good family Good, smart, yeah. sharp, good stockman. Yeah, and you know those are hard to find anymore. <laughs> well, you just you just don't you yeah. know where do you find somebody that can even handle a cow? Right, no doubt. Yeah. So, so, uh, so that was some of it. But just in general, you know, your death loss is mm-hmm. way way below below a half a percent, mm. uh, somewhere between zero and maybe. You know, two and a half, point zero two five percent, or you know, <laughs> right, 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 yeah, yeah. I understand what you're saying. Quarter percent or less. Yeah, yeah. And we, you know, we we 
we did have some young we did wean some cattle in there but we did try to use backgrounding yards mm-hmm. to start cattle sure so you've got you know you've got a lot of cattle in there that are in their prime and their life too so mm-hmm. you know on the ranch we've got cows from one to twelve right you know so something's going to happen to that one of them you know mm-hmm. sure so yeah that's the rest of that story yeah i've always said that less developed countries if i can say it that way have an advantage over us because they figure out how to do things uh without electricity hydraulics and horsepower where we just default to electricity hydraulics mm-hmm. and horsepower yeah you know and yeah. so they're oftentimes miles ahead of us in time in terms of problem solving and some of those things and so i think that kind of goes back to what you were saying about the employees at the stu- at the feed yard and yeah i think of the stockmanship of those people in those countries yeah i mean they've got to handle animals a whole different way right and wild animals too right and that's what made stan parsons and and alan savory unique you know they came from south africa and they were managing big herds of wild animals right and they learned those principles there managing herds of animals on on you know the native ground there and right and brought those principles here and boy those principles were not accepted very well to start with yeah. and we've tweaked them uh, we've backed off a lot of what we used to do there's a common sense approach to that oh uh, well, i i think i took it too far and then we backed off and said hey this we'll manage this way uh, not so intensive mm-hmm. and that's from a grazing perspective from a grazing stamp perspective and also managing large groups of animals mm. we backed off the larger groups of animals because there's just there were just some social issues there and and like with the neighborhood no or, okay. no with the animals with, with the animals and mm-hmm. uh, watering issues were the limiting factor there which mm-hmm. are pushed to the limit but uh we pushed it to the point where you know if you've got a cow and a calf that calf needs to be able to get to the tank Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and we set ourselves up to fail in that regard in some cases and had some health issues was that a quality of life decision the backing off the intensity of no it was health of the animals i see um we had run up to a thousand pair in a group mm-hmm. and sent and that was too many we we run about 300 don't we logan three six by the end of summer so yeah but when the calves are young or even less you know we're managing a little different than we used to yeah we, sure. ca- we calve 150 brand Combined to 300, combined to 600. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like. And is that kind of Sandhills calving style where you're moving the pair? That's, that's correct, yeah. 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 We use ultrasounding to kind of help us. Oh, sure. To, so it's, it's uh, not as much pair an hour or heavy now. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Kind of in 21 day cycles, calving in their own groups. Sure. Yeah, so it's a little different than the, the Sandhills. Right. Because uh, we're, not, we're not taking the. Uh, old calves out of keeping them away from the young cows we're just making smaller groups right well where they're just not so concentrated and that 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 solved that problem for us and it's we don't mind uh having a number of groups to start the season it's the end of you know mid-season the end season where we really need to manage the grass properly sure very good Logan, you said you wanted your dad to do 85 or 90% of the talking. I think we've accomplished that. But have I missed anything major that you wanted to make sure got covered today? You know, uh, the one thing I wrote down was, you know, what, what did you learn? You, you had a unique arrangement with your grandfather. You know, what, what life lessons, and we kind of wanted to hit on it with the lunches, but we didn't go anywhere. But just what life lessons did you learn from A.O. Stanger in the 10 years that you were able to, to work with him? He grew up as a farm boy and always wanted to be a rancher so he turned so Sherman McCoy 
I'm not answering your question completely, but Sherman sure McCoy was a farmer. Then my grandfather turned it into a ranch. I came back and did some innovative farming things in addition to the ranch things. And now Logan's, his emphasis is on back to ranching or cattle. Seems to be, and that's where the opportunities were for me. Mm. And the ranching side's where the opportunities are for, for him. So uh, he wanted to be a cowboy and he talked about, uh, he wanted to be called the old Indian. He thought a lot about how the Indians mm-hmm. looked over the, the land and he'd take me out to a hill and say, can you imagine the Indians sitting them up, up on this hill looking down at the elk and the deer and trying to decide which one they're going to shoot, buffalo. Mm-hmm. Uh, so he was kind of a romantic. Mm. Uh, I'm more of a nuts and bolts guy. Uh, my dad was kind of a romantic too. Mm-hmm. So Sherm was a just do the work and shut up. Mm-hmm. And I have two romantics, and I'm kind of a just do the work and shut up kind <laughs> of a guy. <laughs> so I'm a I'm hands on. I you know I if I'm working, I'm doing hands on things. Mm-hmm. I've got a shovel in my hand. I change oil on my pickup. I service the tractors. I'll, you know, I'm build fence, take out fence. I haven't been involved in the handling of the cattle much in the last few years. And at my age, I don't want to be too, I'm not as spry as I used to be. I'm smart and know where to be. Right. <laughs> but I really don't want to get run over. Yeah. So I'm kind of out of that. And, but I would always bring the cattle up. Most people have the low guy on the totem pole bring the cattle up. Yep. I always oh, brought yeah. the cattle up. Yeah. Because I wanted to be handled properly. Mm-hmm. So, that's, isn't that right? Yeah, that's more common now. Oh, man. Is it? Yeah. Okay. If if anybody ever gives me the choice where to be when we're working cows, I want to be in the back. Yeah. You know, that's that's where I want to be. And that's where the captain steers the ship from. <sighs> yeah. I, I remember one specific day where... I don't know if it was the majority of the group, but it sure seemed like the majority of the groups that came into the shoot had a calf backwards or upside down or both. And I'm like, this is not necessary, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and then you're trying to vaccinate on top yeah. of that. And it's like, yeah, one is the vaccin- vaccination working Two, I've got to stick yeah. my head and my arm down in that alleyway to do that. And yeah, things aren't real. Yeah. So it's like, yeah, yeah. Um, I, we always had employees, so I had that advantage of knowing, learning how to manage employees. To answer your question, Logan, um, even back to your grandpa, grandfather's. yeah, yeah, yeah. My great grandfather would have would have had a number of hired hands, and my grandfather had two or three usually. And I learned from him that you just can't. This isn't negative. But you just can't expect that much out of them. They don't have an ownership stake, and. Mm. You know, expect them to do their work, but don't get to thinking they're you. And that's a really hard lesson for a lot of people to, to learn. Learning how to manage somebody that has that mentality is is hard for the average person. And, and then if you find somebody who has that mentality, you probably know that they're not going to be here forever. That's right. <laughs> they're going to go right. build something of their own, I would guess. Yeah, and we've had really good people work for us and... And just good people. You know, I, I mostly, when I hired people, I just wanted good people. You didn't need to know anything about cows. Sure. I can teach you, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah and we really kind of simplified things. And, in fact, there was a point there when we were involved with Bud Williams that I quit hiring cowboys. <laughs> yep. And it, that was the best thing I ever did. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Because the cowboys, it was about their horse first, yep. not my cattle. Mm-hmm. It took me a while to, to learn that, but I did learn it, and I said, I don't want somebody with a rope and yeehawing around and a rodeo. Mm-hmm. Don't want that. That's no no place on, because the cow, my cows are number one. Mm-hmm. I don't care about the horses. It's the cows that... And I, there's good horse people mm-hmm. that, yeah. but 
they're hard to find unless you unless you own the cows and the horse. <laughs> <laughs> You know what I'm saying? <clears throat> yeah, yeah, very good. I do definitely know what you're saying. <laughs> Appreciate that. Well, uh, Jeff, thank you for your time. And Logan, thanks for setting it up. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. All right, appreciate it. Thanks for the opportunity. Very good stuff there. Really uh, appreciate that family and, and what they have uh, been able to to accomplish and, and keep together and pass on from generation to generation. So uh, really, really enjoyed my opportunity to see it live and in person and meet some of the crew there uh, at Wine Glass Ranch. Coming up next week on the Working Cows podcast, we're going to keep it in southwest Nebraska, and we're going to talk to Jacob Miller. Uh, you maybe know Jacob Miller from Livewire Fence Supply, uh, but Jacob is also a, a grazer and a rancher, and his family's been on a journey of moving their management more towards something that uh, is adapted to their environment, and uh, specifically, they've been surviving or maybe thriving <laughs> through a drought over the last few years and that drought has recently showed signs of breaking and uh, Jacob made a pretty interesting post on Facebook about uh, some of the fruit that their management decisions over the last few years and really last couple of decades have borne on their ranch as this drought has begun to break and we're also going to pepper in a little discussion with Jacob about his uh, move to an animal that can thrive in a drier environment, which happens in his case to be some sheep and, and some of the ways that he thinks about that. So looking forward to sharing with you that conversation with Jacob Miller coming your way real soon on another episode of the Working Cows podcast. We invite you to visit workingcows.net to subscribe to the show via iTunes or Stitcher. You'll also find detailed show notes pages, resources from our guests, and the industry leaders who have influenced them. For more ideas on putting your cows to work for you in a more profitable way, tune in next week. <laughs>